There's a famous quote that investors and traders always tell each other, never short a dull market. And while mega caps continue to stair step higher ahead of Nvidia's earnings, the rest of the market looks a little bit weaker. So is it time to get bearish or at the very least look for downside protection since it often pays to be a contrarian and since Wall Street's last bear Mike Wilson has finally flipped bullish is downside now the real contrarian trade and is shorting the path of least resistance? And that's what we're here to answer today. We're also going to be tackling momentum as well as looking at the overall health of the consumer. Are things starting to fall apart? We're going to discuss that as well as Memorial Day seasonality and why this chart will be the ultimate driver of flows for the next six months. So is it time to start opening shorts? What should we expect from Nvidia's earnings tomorrow? Is this the end? We got a lot to talk about, so let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks in the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, guys, please subscribe. We're trying to hit 10,000 subscribers in May. Hit that notification bell, like this video, and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. And it was a pretty slow Tuesday. There were winners, there were losers in the market here today. We saw a big defensive rotation here in staples as well as utilities. But what didn't participate was healthcare. It was half and half as well as telecom services. There was also some very, very interesting trade here in financials, particularly the big banks, JP Morgan, BAC, Wells Fargo, Citigroup. Diversified banks were very, very green, barring some of, if not all of yesterday's losses after Jamie Dimon came out and made some remarks with regards to the market, him retiring early, and that just weighed on bank stocks as a whole. But we saw financials come back in a very, very big way. But not the same can be said for credit services. Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Capital One just didn't participate the same way that insurance, financial data, and asset management did, and PayPal leading the charge lower in that subsector. But really, you think leading up to Nvidia's earnings, you'd see Nvidia rally, but most of semiconductors didn't. It was actually a really rough day for technology as a whole bar the big boys nvidia microsoft apple google everything else fell i mean look at a software application and the half of semiconductors then look at the small side of infrastructure tech and then look at communication services right and meta so it really was like a magnificent seven rally with financials tesla and then some defensive sectors diving into the actual sector analysis the spy returned 0.25 percent today excluding that the best performing sector by a wide margin was actually xlu followed by then financials discretionary staples and then commodities so there was no real lead today actually it was cyclicals defensives there were some uh, growth sectors you know discretionary in there as well so again a very mixed trade very very similar to what we've pretty much seen throughout 2024 you know we have uh, some winners we have some losers and then we have the spy right here outperforming most sectors not much to take away from the sector analysis here today but let's hop on the charts now, the S&P 500 was up 0.25% here today. The NASDAQ was up 0.21%. The Dow Jones up 0.17%, but the broader market didn't participate. So it goes to show that it really was the mega caps that did a lot of the heavy lifting. But it's not to say like the broader market was absolutely terrible, you know, pretty much flat on the day. Same here with mid caps down 0.17%, S&P 600 and IWM. So fairly flat day, slight down day for these smaller names in the market we saw growth outperform value ever so slightly and then if we actually just pull up a chart here of treasury yields the 10-year yield actually did lose 0.8 percent here on the day and that had to do with some of the fed speak fed waller came out and made some very very dovish comments i wouldn't even call it dovish these were just outright bullish comments. He said April CPI shows progress to 2% inflation has resumed. Probability of a recession seems to have disappeared. Interesting. He thinks we can rule out that inflation is re-accelerating. We'll need several more months of good data to cut rates. And he actually revised the statement saying if the data comes in softer than expected, we could get the first rate cut by December. And that's part of the reason why the market actually rallied intraday. If we actually hop on the five minute chart here of the S&P 500, you can see that we actually gapped down and we were fairly negative here on the day. We were actually down about 0.3% at one point very, very early. Fed Waller made his remarks as the market opened and we actually rallied hard. A lot of the losses on the day went positive for the day. And then we just made higher lows and higher highs to pretty much finish up 0.25% for the day. The 10 year yield is also at a very, very interesting position. If we just go to the daily chart and zoom out, we just put a very, very easy trend line right here. That's a very, very interesting spot for the 10 year yield. And we do know that support becomes resistance. Now you do have to focus more on the macro here when it comes to the yield situation, but we've used this line as resistance multiple times, four times right here, the 4.312% line. We can actually see that we are slowly making our way 
to this line if we do get here expect quite a bit of resistance but if we do break below resistance does become support and then we can see a sustained move to the downside here in yields but obviously it's going to come down to the macro softer data and how people interpret that data now commodities had a very very interesting trade crude oil was actually down significantly here today it was actually down 0.81 percent and that's because the biden administration is going to release a lot of oil from the spr the strategic petroleum reserves and that's obviously going to have a massive effect on the crude markets that is trying to lower prices heading into this election we actually saw silver continue to gain making highs but there's quite a bit of volatility a lot of shorts a lot of bears coming in at the top here gold did pull back ever so slightly but still trading at pretty much highs now let's actually dive into the daily chart of the s p 500 now let's first look at the weekly chart i know the week is not over but we can actually see that we are slightly positive here for the week up 0.43 percent now hopping on the daily chart we've actually officially used the 5300 zone as a support level so generally speaking we can actually see that you know we made our way to the 5300 area found a bit of resistance and now we've used the 5300 area as support and breaking above it now 5300 will offer a lot of support if we do pull back it was the previous gamma flip zone and there is still a lot of gamma built at the strike and that's why it's acting as a very very big support so this is the line in the sand right now but ultimately what we want to look to is 5400 in perpetuity because that is where the core gamma resistance strike is right now and that's probably where we're going to travel to in this market everything looks primed for us to go higher the technicals the fundamentals the macro picture we even have some dovish fed speak on our side and as long as nvidia earnings comes in line tomorrow everything should be a-okay with regards to nvidia's earnings tomorrow we are expecting 21.03 billion dollars in revenue that should be eps of 4.73 192 percent gain year over year nuts and eps growth of 476 dollars compared to the same quarter last year of 0.82 and 7.19 billion so data center revenues have really accelerated nvidia's revenue to the upside so if nvidia's earnings comes in line maybe a beat we see some margin expansion that's really going to support further upside in equity markets to that 5400 strike that we've been talking about for a while if nvidia earnings comes in line expect 5300 as the floor and we probably will move higher to the 5350 5400 area very very quickly even by the end of the week nvidia has a huge pull in the semiconductor space that'll lift all semis that'll lift the nasdaq 100 that'll lift the s p 500 and we should see a continuation of the rally a bit concerning if we do miss however i do think we will find support at these levels if nvidia misses earnings the first one is the 5250 area and the second one is just the 5200 area now i do know that's a 100 point range but if nvidia earnings comes in line 5300 should be the floor we move higher if maybe everything comes in line but the street just doesn't like where the valuation is we could probably sell all the way to 5250 find support right here and then move if nvidia just miss earnings for the most part we could actually see an extended sell to the 5200 area in the s p 500 now 5245 is actually the gamma flip zone as you can see right here so 5250 should offer support regardless of what nvidia does and i do expect the bulls to enter in a big way if we do get here do i think it's going to happen i don't think so i think nvidia is probably going to come in line or beat we saw how much these big tech names apple microsoft nvidia have increased their capital expenditure specifically for ai we saw taiwan semi release their sales for march it was a 60 percent year over year increase and by extension that means nvidia's revenue is increasing so i think we're going to see very good earnings from nvidia tomorrow but you have the game plan right there we pull to these levels if nvidia come in line or miss if they beat and the streets bullish on guidance and then move higher to the 5400 area now guys i got some seasonal stats ahead of memorial day here now this is the week before memorial day and the returns we can expect in the current week we're in now memorial day is on the 27th of may which is next monday and across the board average returns median returns are very very positive for the dow jones the s p 500 the nasdaq and the russell 2000 this is the last 20 years of data so it's a huge data pool to draw from and pretty much what this data set tells us is that you want to be long during this week now we're going to look at the s p 500 and the russell 2000 average return for the s p 500 is 0.85 percent 15 up years five down years 15 and 5 75 percent of the time higher and the russell 2000 1.59 percent return so very very upbeat here for small caps high volatility 16 and 4 80 percent of the time higher very very positive stats if you think that things can't get any crazier think again 
seasonally, history tells us that we should expect a bullish week. Now, the S&P 500 isn't the only index producing outsized returns. We can actually see that markets across the globe are actually at all time highs and in most cases reporting double digit growth especially from their lows. This is MSCI Global Markets year-to-date performance. And we can actually see right here, the red is actually China. MSCI China is actually the best performing equity market since late January. Now looking at this red one, it's actually the recovery from the low. Most stocks have actually made lows, some of them double digit lows. And these are the returns they're currently at. So you can see a 31% from the low. The low at one point was down 12%. In just a single quarter, the China index fell 12% and then rallied a further 30 31% absolutely crazy. And this has actually been the case for a lot of global markets, not so much the United States. The S&P 500 right here fell 2% and is now up 13% year to date. But then we look at stuff like Australia at one point down 7%, currently up 8% from the lows. Look at Japan up 9% from the lows. Look at India up 10% for the lows. Taiwan up 26% from their lows. So stocks are rallying and it's not just the S&P 500 and it's not just the S&P 500 making highs we're actually seeing global market momentum and that's what you really want to see in a bull market it's not just one index it's all of them something else we see in bull markets is capitulation we see a lot of bears towards the tail end of the rally get on board the bull market and oftentimes that does signal that the rally will continue but we are closer to the top than we are to the bottom and one of those bears is one of wall street's biggest bears mike wilson he has been one of the biggest bears on the street his s p 500 12 month target at the start of this year was 45 500. He just upped his target from 4,500 to 5,400 by the end of 2024. That's 20% upside from year. And the last bear on Wall Street has finally capitulated. And this is the type of stuff you see in bull markets. You see broad based participation across all indices, and you also see bears turn tail and turn into bulls. And while the top may be months and months away, this is often a feature of bull markets. Now, another feature that's contributing to the everything rally we're seeing right now in stocks, in sectors, in global markets is earnings. We can see here that S&P 500 earnings have actually come in very, very good. Profits rose in seven out of 11 sectors and revenues in eight of those sec sectors. Profit margins are also rising from already healthy levels, and that's because revenues are rising and profits are rising. By extension, margins simply increase. And the only places we're seeing margin contraction is financials and healthcare. We're actually seeing margins rise in every other sector as well. And this is why US stocks are doing so well. Earnings are increasing, margins are expanding, and in that type of environment, you want to own stocks. But it's not just US markets. We're seeing earnings per share revisions here in the Japanese market, very, very strong revisions. We're seeing the same year in the S&P 500. We're seeing the same year in Europe, this light blue line, the stock 600, you know, earnings have actually bottomed and the same thing with emerging markets. Earnings across the globe are getting revised to the upside because they're simply coming in better than expected. And when earnings come in better than expected, margins come in better than expected. And when earnings increase, margins increase, you want to own equities. And that's why equities are rallying across the globe. And when stocks increase earnings, they literally make more money. And the best way that companies can put that money to work is through buybacks. And the S&P 500 is approaching above $800 billion worth of buybacks. Not close to the bubble levels we saw here in 2021, 2022. But let's be real, this was a very, very weird situation. And this right here is still a plus for overall market momentum. But it's not just the US. Here in Japan, we're seeing a sharp increase in buyback announcements. And this is almost the same amount of buybacks announced in April as the total in some years. And this could actually be the highest buyback announcements since 2015. And buybacks are very, very good for stocks. This is Intel. And essentially what happened when they were buying back the stock versus when they started increasing CapEx and diluting their shareholders. You can see that when buyback stopped, it marked almost the top in the stock. And we've been on a downtrend ever since actually making lower lows and lower highs compared to 2017 to 2021 when they were buying back a ton of their stock. You know, the stock actually rallied very close to 100% from about the $30 level all the way to $70 plus. So share buybacks really put a floor underneath a stock and they also help with overall market sentiment. Now that's what corporations do with their spending. What about governments? Now the fourth year of a presidential cycle tends to see big spending. The fourth year, normally politicians trying to buy the vote, normally sees US government year over year spending of 
9.8% and the normalized spending year over year growth of 10.5% versus every other year, which is anywhere from 5 to 6%. So trust in election year for politicians to start dishing out money. And ultimately, the goal year is to get more money in the hands of the voter, in the hands of the consumer. Now, the consumer is not looking too great. I wouldn't say they're looking weak as well. They do have still quite a bit of excess savings, almost 700 billion, but it is down heavily from its peak year at 2.3 trillion in 2021. You can also see that the personal savings rate as a percentage of disposable income is actually at 3.6%, so still very, very low, well below the average of 8.5%. And that is a bit concerning because consumers are simply not saving. However, inflation adjusted growth in deposits by income percentile in total sitting at 6%. Again, well below the average. I would say the average is probably closer to 8 or 9%, but not necessarily bad either. Call it middle of the road. Now, consumers are saving less because inflation is still an issue, right? Even though we are seeing disinflation, at the end of the day, if the inflation rate right now is 3.6% in CPI, that's still a 3.6% increase year over year in consumer prices. Consumers are still having to pay more and that's why they're simply saving less. And this situation right here, excess savings, personal savings, as well as uh, deposits is actually all right. It's not anything to worry about if the employment situation stays the same. Right now, the employment uh, rate is 3.9%. If this doesn't change, if people stay employed, if they continue to make money, then they can just keep spending. But the problem is if the employment rate is to tick up sharply, consumers don't only have savings to fall back on, they tap into their excess savings. And that's when you get some real serious problems in the economy. Now, for the most part, consumption is still staying very, very high. And this is telling us that consumers do have money. Real personal consumption expenditure is still well above the trend right here. This dotted line is the overall trend. We're still well above the trend after diverging from that trend in 2021 after the pandemic. Consumers have jobs. They're making money from their jobs, but they're spending a lot of that money. They're not saving a lot. And we know this because disposable income and employee compensation on an annualized basis, one year annualized is at 4.1% and 5.7%, well above the PCE inflation rate of 2.7%. So consumers are making money. The problem is they're not saving that money and they're spending that money. And that just has to do with the overall inflationary environment we've seen in the last five to six years since 2020. Now let's switch gears, talk about Gamma. Very, very interesting developments. Not much has changed from yesterday. We are seeing the 5400 strike consolidate and really become its own. Sometimes after OPEX, the first couple of days, we can actually see, you know, the core gamma strikes like change leadership. It might go from one strike and move back below, but we are starting to see the 5400 strike really just build out a lot of gamma. So traders are looking at this as the June OPEX target. Something else that's changed drastically is the gamma flip zone. It's now at 52.45. It's really moving up the tape as markets have also grinded ever so slightly higher. And we're also starting to see that there's a little bit of negative gamma here above the gamma flip zone. So if we do actually get below the 5300 area, particularly if we break below this huge strike, yes, there is still more positive gamma, but we can actually see quite a bit of volatility. So below the 5300, we can definitely start selling. I would look at the 5245 as support right now, but be wary that if we do get below this 5300 area, we can definitely see sharp turns to the downside and to the upside. That being said, we are aiming for 5400. We are in positive gamma. We are above the gamma flip. So buy dips, sell rips all the way to the 5400 area until we get below the gamma flip zone. So guys, earnings this week, we didn't have anything significant here on Tuesday, but tomorrow we have Target, we have Nvidia, Snowflake, TJ Maxx. We're going to be covering all of these stocks in tomorrow's video. So stay tuned, subscribe so you don't miss a beat. And then for the rest of the week, we have a couple of software names, tech names, Intuit Workday, Ralph Lauren on Thursday. And that's pretty much it for S&P 500 earnings. I think after this week, we just have stuff like Costco, Adobe, a couple of other names, and then Q1 earnings for the S&P 500 will be done. Now, looking at data, guys, tomorrow we have the FOMC minutes and then nothing much of significance. We have mortgage applications as well, existing home sales, PMIs on the 23rd, and then durable goods here on the 24th, along with sentiment data. And normally no news is good news. Uneventful macro weeks are normally the best weeks for stocks, returning 0.62% versus every other week where we have one, two, or three major macro releases. We normally see returns of 0.2 to 0.3%. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, like this video, and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.